Uh, we are now, Baruch Hashem, Mamash, three days before Rosh Hashanah begins. Rosh Hashanah, according to the Jewish tradition, it's the day that Hashem created Adam Arishon, Adam. Adam and Eve. The story of Adam and Eve, Rosh Hashanah. It's his birthday of Adam Arishon, and therefore it's, a, it's an annual trial for all mankind. All the people in the world are being judged annually every year from the day Adam was created until this moment. Jews, non-Jews, even the animals, nature, the whole world, countries. Why a person needs to be judged? Judged for what? Because people are different than animals. Animals are not being judged as far as guilty or not guilty. They're being judged if they should stay to live or they'll die this year. That's it. But people, because they live with free choice, they choose what to do, right or wrong. Based on their choices, they either get rewarded or they get punished. How do we know it? Very simple. We, the Jewish people, we had the merit to receive the Torah from the Creator of the world about 3,300 years ago in a public event. We are different than the 80,000 fake religions and cults who came after. That all of them started with the story of one individual. No one ever witnessed it. No one can back it up. The, the, some of the books that they have, it's full of human errors. We don't have the time today to credit or discredit different books and different religions. If you are interested to see some of my work, you can go on my website, divineinformation.com. Over there, there's thousands of lectures. Some of them are debates with atheists, with Christian priests, with all kinds of people that contradict, try to contradict the Torah, and they got their lesson. They realized that the Torah is a divine document. It was given in a public event. In the Torah, it's written in oral Torah. We learn many of the things that Hashem, the creator of the world, is thinking what he likes, what he hates. When will he pay us greatly? When will he will punish us greatly? We need to know it. If a person doesn't care about the consequences of his actions, it could be either one of the two. One is not normal, the brain is not functioning. And the second option is that he's totally ignorant. He has no idea what's going on. He doesn't know what's right, what's wrong, what's the obligation to do or not to do. Ignorance is the biggest danger to the life of the human being. Nothing is more dangerous than to be ignorant especially in the most important thing in the life of the human being. The book that was given to him or to her by the creator of the world with the secret, what is the purpose of life? If a person doesn't know the purpose of life, how exactly is going to be successful? If a person wants to be a computer engineer and he never learned one hour computers, what chance he has to succeed, right? If a person wants to be the best football player in the world and never, not once in his life he held a football, what chance he has to be a great player or a tennis player? If a person wants to be a lawyer, great lawyer, and he never went to law school, what chance does he have to be a lawyer? If a person wants to be righteous and go to heaven when he dies and he never held the book of God and never learned it carefully, how exactly is he going to make it? There's no chance to make it. The more ignorant you are, the more you're going to lose. That's the rule. So therefore, tonight you're going to have an opportunity to taste a little bit from the divine wisdom and finally to open up your eyes and see that life is not what you think, at least some of you. Many of the people here in the world, when you ask them, what's, what's your plan in life? What's the purpose? Their answer would be to be successful, to be a professional, to make money, to buy a nice house in Great Neck, you know? to have a nice car, to go on vacation two or three times a year, to have children, to dress well, to be healthy, you know, to be loved by people, to be popular, to be a movie star, to be a professor, everyone with his dream. More or less, I think I cover what people like, no? Most of the people wants to be rich. Why? In their mind, being rich will make me happy. Although it's been proven millions of times that money never bring happiness, still almost every person still think that that's what's going to make him happy 
but it's not really true. Because I'll give you an example. If a person is rich all his life, and he only buy expensive things, the most expensive car, the most expensive jewelry, clothes, everything, the most expensive in the world, all his life, none of it ever brings him happiness. It's convenience, that's it. A poor person that never can afford anything, he only buys clothes in a second-hand store, it's all used, $10, $5, $20 a suit, because he can never afford to buy a suit in the store. Imagine if one time he goes to the store and he gets a suit that is almost brand new, worth maybe a few hundred dollars, and he got it for twenty dollars. He comes home all week, he's happy. So a poor person can reach higher happiness than a very wealthy person. So we see that the the wealth doesn't come necessarily the, the happiness doesn't come really from the wealth. It comes from the feeling of the mind. It's not necessarily the money. For instance, some people are artists. It will make them very happy that their picture will be in the best gallery, even if they won't make a penny. Some people want to show how great they play basketball. They're willing to play in the NBA for free all their life, without a salary, just to be famous, even without being rich. Why? That's what makes him happy, to show that he's very talented. Same thing musicians, many other examples I can give you. They ask Bill Gates, you're the right person to ask this question. Does money bring happiness? He actually got angry. That was in a live interview in Israel on primetime television. He said, absolutely not. It only brings convenience, no happiness whatsoever. There's a whole uh, line of chairs right here, over there. You can have a seat here. So Bill Gates answered the mystery that all the people dream about becoming rich. He answered, no, it's not going to bring us any happiness. What will make a person happy? Things that will make his soul happy. If the soul will be happy, then the person will be happy. If the soul will be upset, nothing can make a person happy. It's all spiritual feeling. Spirituality can make you happy, or, or sad, but that's it. Rest of the things, aggravation, pain, all these things that happens when it comes to materialistic things, it's all temporary anyway. Even if you lose a hundred dollars on the street, just fell from you, you're upset for a minute or two, and you move on with your life. You're not gonna sit and cry forever. Even when someone dies, you're upset for a month or two, and you move on with your life. You know, even if you got fired, so you're upset for a week, and you move on with your life. Even you win the lottery, you're happy for a month or two or three, and you move on with your life. Even you meet the most beautiful woman in the world, and you got married to her. Six months later, you don't feel anything special anymore. You bought the nicest mansion in Beverly Hills. You're very happy for six months and you move on with your life. It does not bring you any happiness. But spiritual things, since it's spirituality, it's nothing to do with materialism, they are always eternal. It's all eternity. And it's all connected to the soul. And the soul, the soul of the human being, is actually a part of God himself. It's a spark from God. That's why he will never die. That's why it's not limited, not to time, not to sounds, not to anything. The soul has no limitation. So we are now three days before Rosh Hashanah. Most of the Jews in the world don't have any idea that Rosh Hashanah is a judgment day. If you ask most Israelis or most Persians here in Great Neck, or in Beverly Hills, or in Brooklyn, or in Queens, or in Manhattan, doesn't matter, anywhere you go. Australia. Ask all the Jews over there, what's Rosh Hashanah? They'll tell you the first day of the Jewish year. And it's a holiday. And that's it. And what are you going to do? I'm going to the Kinneret, to Tiberias. Shish kebab, making a tent, playing sheshbesh, bagamin, you know, with my belly outside, eating seeds. You know, that's what I'm going to do. He has no idea. It's not a... It's, we're not talking about evil people here. We're not talking about wicked people here. We're talking about Jews that came to this world and they live one million percent like animals. Not even like Goim. Because the Goim has more connection to religion than most of these Jews. The Goim, many of them, when I speak to them, in two minutes they begin to ask questions about conversions. Two minutes! In the airport, here, there. Right away they begin to ask. What happens if a person wants to be Jewish? Can he become Jewish? What does he have to do? 
two, three, five, ten minutes. Every guy takes an X amount of time, but very fast. As soon as you prove to them this God, they already know in the back of their mind the Jews are special people. They already know it. Whether they like the Jews, they hate the Jews regardless. One thing they do know, one time a person in the auction told me, I cannot stand Jews, but the bottom line, you are the chosen people and we are not. <coughs> I gotta respect you whether I like it or not. I said, at least you're honest. <laughs> Both ways. You understand the idea? So in the back of their mind, they know it's the chosen people. They read in the Torah what they call the Old Testament. They read about it in their churches. The Arabs learn about it in madrasa, in their school. They know God chose the Jews. He gave them the Torah. Without the Jews, the world will be a zoo. The only reason the world have order and spirituality is thanks to the Jews. No one in the world will know that God created the world in six days and seven days he rested without the Jews. No one would know about the soul without the Jews. No one would know this life after death without the Jews. No one would know about the concept of reward and punishment without the Jews. No one would know about heaven and hell when we die without the Jews. No one would know about reincarnations without the Jews. Basically everything positive, spiritual that people know, all came from the Jews. That's why Muhammad, Muhammad called us the nation of the book. The nation that brought the book of God to the world. So, loving or hating, that's besides the point. Those who are honest will tell you right away. The Dalai Lama told few Israelis that came to him, I don't get it. Why you come to me? You come from the nation that taught the world everything we know. Why would you come to me when you're from Israel? Go and check over there. He even made a shiduch between one Israeli secular guy to one Israeli secular girl that they both became religious after he told them about Judaism. And he actually made a match between them. They got married. The Dalai Lama. Why, well, you the Jews, you coming to me? He said to them. And he's considered a spiritual leader. He knows. They know. So we have to understand one thing. Most of the Jews have no idea what Rosh Hashanah is. Now again, not because they're evil. They came to the world and they were raised like animals. What does it mean like animal? I'm not talking, it's not derogatory. Animals are free. They don't have guidelines. They don't have constitution. They don't have Ten Commandments. They don't have reward and punishments. They don't have judgments. They don't have jails. They don't have, none of these things apply to a lion that murder a zebra. No one is upset with him. Everybody understand, that's the way nature is. The lion is hungry, he needs to eat the zebra. That's the way the Creator wanted. That's how he made the world. Nothing we can do to the lion. No one can come to the lion and say, can you wait 10, 15 minutes until we finish taking pictures of this beautiful zebra before you kill it? 10 minutes wait. No one can talk to him. He's hungry right now, that's what he wants to do. He's a robot. He's programmed to eat when he's hungry. That's it. Or when he has animal instincts, he see a female, he attacks her. A monkey see trees, right away, jump on the trees. This is natural reaction, whether it's good or not, regardless. But that's the animal's natural re reaction. Dogs, when they see someone comes to the door, they always get excited. They always will behave the same. You already know in advance what your animal is going to do. But when you deal with a person, you never know what he's going to do. You may know his nature, but his next choice, you don't know. Sometimes he will choose to go, sometimes he will choose not to go. You ask him, how come yesterday you went and today you don't want to go? Yesterday there was a righteous person, so I wanted to go with him in a car, to spend an hour with him and talk nice positive things. And today was a wicked person. I didn't want to spend an hour with him in a car to, to hear about his nonsense. So why yesterday I went? Because for spiritual reasons. Why today I did not go? For spiritual reasons. You don't have it by animals. An animal will go with anyone. It's not going to be, it's not a matter of choice here. So they live with instinct. That's why they don't have heaven. That's why they don't have hell. That's why they don't have reincarnations. That's why they never got the Torah. The animals don't have it. But we the people, the Jews and the non-Jews, mostly the Jews by far, we are here we have X amount of time and every minute is very precious. It's totally different than what you were, you were educated with and trained 
because most of the Jews, especially the ones who raised secular, they were raised totally the opposite of the Creator's will. Totally the opposite. The Creator never said to kill yourself all your life to have a career to make money. The Creator says in the Torah, I decide how much money every person would have. Whether he's smart, whether he's stupid. Whether he's a male, whether he's a female. Whether he's young, whether he's old. Whether he's healthy, whether he's sick. Whether he's educated, whether he's not educated. I decide 100%, regardless how many college degrees you have, what college you went to, who is your father, who is your mother, regardless. I decide how much you have. All you have to do is to trust me that I feed you. Once you do that, you have nothing to worry about. Everything I'll do for you. You don't trust me, you're going to have to be like a goy. Work, education, college, working extra time, extra hours. You chose to be a slave, you're going to get your money as a slave. You chose to be free for spirituality, for your real purpose in life, like I told you as a Jew in the world. You trust me that I will feed you, I will take care of all your needs. All I need from you is to rely on me. Never to doubt me, never to question me, to know that at any given moment I only do what's right for you. Not what you want. What's right for you, because I know better for you what's right for you. I can give you millions of dollars right now, but I know it's going to take you away from me. For this person, it's worth it for me to give him. The more I give him, the more religious he will be. The more charity he will give. The more he will come to learn. Now when he has a lot of money, he really comes and does good things with that. If I will give you money, you're going to buy a Ferrari, you're going to get Goyot, you're going to go to the club, you're going to be Mechalel Shabbat, you're going to buy cocaine. I know who I'm dealing with. That's why I like you, I don't want to give it to you. If I want to get rid of you, that's what I'm going to do, I'll give you millions. You already destroy yourself and you will have no share to the world to come. You may think it's nice, 20 years later you find out that it was the worst thing that have happened to you. Many of the people who became wealthy, they went off the derech, many. What really caused them to go away from God and the purpose? The temptations. Before they couldn't afford, now they could, that's the difference. Now they were able to go first class and to go to the clubs of Manhattan and pay $500 a night and to start buying all kinds of nonsense which took them completely away from their devotion, from the purpose, from the right direction. It messed up their life. Children. Which children are becoming more religious? The poor children that grow up with almost nothing or the very wealthy children? Look at the world. Check everywhere you go. Every country. I've been almost everywhere. Uh, when I come to the poor families in Yerushalayim, in Bnei Brak, these the kids have nothing. They, 20 shekel a month they don't get from their parents. Because their parents don't have. They live only in one or two bedrooms in tiny places. All they have is Torah and holiness. And they are very religious. Yes, they cannot afford the lifestyle of America. But when they die, they go to life of eternity full of pleasures. People who can afford a lot of things here, when they die, they go to a horrible place forever. So which, which way is better? To enjoy 20, 30 years here and then suffer forever? Or to have it a little bit tight over here? Not that they suffer. I promise you they are much, much, much happier than us. You don't believe me? I will make a panel. We'll take a lie detector and we check the children in Yerushalayim, in the Talmud Torah, the ones that barely make a living and barely pay the bills, and take the richest people here in town, connect them to lie detector and see who is happier. Bnei Brak, it's not a rich city. Almost everyone there is barely making a living. Bnei Brak has less heart attacks than any city in the world. Any city in the world. There's thousands of cities. Bnei Brak, number one. No heart attacks almost at all. Why? Everyone religious. 98% Shomer Shabbat. Everyone connects to Torah. And everyone lives very simple. No stress, no book stock market, no arguments, no courts, no fighting, lawyers, none of these things. Simple lifestyle, no high expectation, 100% spirituality. And since they never got used to the fancy lifestyle, they don't feel they miss anything. A person only suffers when he got used to fancy lifestyle and it was taken away from him. If he always lived simple, it doesn't kill him. That's it, I don't know any better. Once he had fancy lifestyle and then he moved on to a very, very 
miserable lifestyle mentally destroys him. Some of the rich kids in all communities, Persian, Syrian, in the rich communities, they grew up in beautiful mansion, 10 million dollar homes, everything they want they always had, they always have the maid, the maid does everything for them, they have credit cards from their parents, fancy cars, parents pay for their car, everything. One day they have to become independent. Not everyone has, has generous parents. Some, the parents, as long as you live by us, you enjoy the wealth of the house. Once you move on, you're on your own, that's it. So he goes to become a, a professional in some company in Manhattan for 60,000 a year. He was spending it as a single guy or single girl in their parents' home, much more than that. Now they have to support the family with that, to get married, to pay the rent. They move into a one-bedroom apartment and it destroys them mentally. They go, they depress constantly. Why? Because their parents raised them in such a spoiled environment. Now they have to move on to the real world. world. <coughs> and it's a very big shock for them. It's a trauma. Or some of them, when they have to go to yeshiva in Yerushalayim, and they get a room that is not exactly Hilton, you know, and they see the conditions over there, after a week they run away. They cannot learn, they cannot stay there. Why? The shower is not the hundred thousand dollars made in Italy. It's very hard for him. Rabbi, I'm, I'm coming from my house in Ocean Park, we're into this place, five guys in a small room. Uh, come on, it's a killer. Not to talk about putting them in the army, they kill themselves. You understand? So it's only in the mind of a person. I'll give you another example. If a person grew up like a goy, meaning his parents did not ever teach him how to behave according to the rules of the Torah, he has no idea. He doesn't know what modesty for women is. He doesn't know what the relationship between men and women. He doesn't know what a kosher marriage is. He doesn't know any of that. Because everywhere he went, everyone is divorced, everyone is cheating. The society he lives in is horrible and rotten. And there's no integrity between people. That's the way he saw everyone, his uncle, his cousin. Everyone's divorced, everyone is cheating, everyone has girlfriends. This is where he lives. Everywhere we go, in school, in high school, he had already 50 girlfriends. He, now he has to one day establish his life. What is the chance that someone like that will be a good husband, that will be able to establish a good kosher home and raise children in a proper way? What is the chance? Almost zero. That's why almost everyone gets divorced. And those who doesn't get divorced, they also suffer anyway, one way or the other. It's very bad. Look, look around. Look what's going on. Look what's going on. But you take two Hasidish boys and girls, not once in their life they spoke to, a guy never spoke to a girl. Not on the street, not in the house, not anywhere. Not, he doesn't have internet, doesn't have smartphone. He goes to yeshiva, he learns in yeshiva, one day he's 19 years old, all his life, holiness, prayers, Torah, watch his eyes, doesn't have internet, no access, none of these things. One day he goes out with an 18 years old girl, or 20 and 19, and she never ever spoke to a man. She doesn't have what to compare to. Her mind is not contaminated with 15 boyfriends like someone else. So her mind is clean, her soul is pure. She doesn't know any better. She goes on a date, she sees a guy, she doesn't really know any better, and she likes him, he likes her, and they get married, and they're very happy. Why? Why are they happy? Because their mind is clean. It did not, it was not stuffed with all the dirt of this world. The more dirt you stuff, the harder it is. That's why the Bali Tshuva, they have the hardest time to get married. Why? Because they grew up secular. And they used to make scenes with girls and guys many, many times. And now, when they come to get married, he wants the same girls he used to date, like this Goya and like that one. And in his mind, he's, in his mind, life is a movie. What he sees on the movies. Very difficult for him to be satisfied with a clean, kosher lifestyle. It's not good enough for him, for his desires. That's why every second of his life will be a torture. Because he got himself a, to become an addict, just like a drug addict. That you take away his drugs, how much he suffer. There are different kinds of drugs. There's heroin and cocaine. If you take heroin from a drug addict, it's gonna kill you. And there are other addicts for cars, for jewelry, for clothing, for shopping, 
for vacations. That's all Sadiq Shens. Take it away from a person, he would like to die. How many people kill themselves as soon as they lose money? Technically, it's so stupid to kill yourself because you lost money. Now, you may say, wait a minute, Rabbi, this person had $20 million, and in one hour in a stock market, he left with nothing. Or maybe now he owes $5 million. He got wiped out in a day. Of course he's going to kill himself. First of all, it's stupid. Even for that, he should not have killed himself. But at least we understand the stress. Okay. But I'm talking someone who has $100 million, and he lost 10 in one day. He also killed himself. Ten million in one day. Moshe, what happened? <laughs> Out attack. Nine one one. But he have ninety. Doesn't make him happy. He see what he lost. The idea is Rabotai. There are many different kinds of addictions. Many. If a person doesn't clean himself from the addictions, how is he gonna be married? How? How is he going to have a kosher re relationship? How is he going to have a clear re relationship? How is he going to be a good father? Everything he ever see was a bad example. Anger, stress, disrespect in the house, curses, dirty language, cheating, horrible behaving, no unity. Now he has to move it into his own house. How? I know I'm saying a little bit hard things here. I'm counting on your honesty to know that I'm not here Chaz Shalom, to put anyone down. I just want to wake us up from some kind of a dream that we live in sometimes. Some of us are deep in a dream, some of us not so deep. But almost all of us are dreaming. There is what we think is right, and there is what's right. And who is the only one that can tell people what's right and wrong? The one that made them the creator of the world. No one else can say what's right and wrong. Not me, not him, not her, no one. The only one can say what's the real good is the one who invented the term good. The only one that can say what's bad is the one that defined the word bad. He's the only one can say what's good and bad. We, according to our understanding, almost everything we call good, it's bad. And almost everything we call bad is good. I'll give you a few examples. For people today, almost everyone would say to be rich is good. Not always true. Many people, it's very bad for them. So sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. But according to humanity, everyone thinks it's good. To be poor, everyone would agree it's bad. It's not true. Poverty, it's a huge advantage. It makes a person depend on God every second of his life. He has faith, he has confidence, he has no one to rely on. He lives more simple, he's not materialistic, it gives him more time for Torah. He cannot go after all the temptations and the toys that the world has to offer. So what really saved the eternity of that person is his poverty. If he was rich, he wouldn't be such a righteous person. Like the Gemara said, Rabbi Yoshua was a very ugly man. So the daughter of the Caesar, the Roman Caesar, this was 2,000 years ago, she said to him, such brilliance in such an ugly tool. Meaning, your brain is in such an ugly face. Why such a br smart brain is in such a face? Couldn't God make a nice, handsome face to put your brain inside? So he said to her, your father, the king, where does he store his wine? So she said, in oil barrel or ceramic. He said to her, wine of the king, expensive old wine, in barrel of wood, worth two penny, two dollar. How come you don't put it in gold and silver like the king should? She said, you know what, you're right. We, are, we shouldn't be like the ordinary people. We are the king. She comes to her father, Dad, why we put all the wine in, in, or in wood barrel and ceramic? We should move it into gold and silver. Why? We are, you the king, we are the royal family. Okay, move everything to the gold and to the silver. <laughs> After two days, it all became vinegar. <laughs> you know what happened when you put wine in silver or... It becomes vinegar, it all became sour. The father went crazy, it's a 
tremendous damage, all the barrels of wine, handmade. He came to his daughter, who gave you such a stupid advice? She said, the rabbi, bring the rabbi. So he said to the rabbi, why do you will give such an advice to my daughter? The rabbi said, she started with me, so I gave her back. So he said, well, what did she say to you? She said, how come such brilliance and such an ugly head? So the father was happy that his daughter, you know, gave it to the rabbi like this. So he said to her, but she has a point, no? Why God made you like this ugly? He forgot about the wine already. <laughs> he heard that the Jew was insulted, it's already worth it for him. The damage. So, she, so he said to him, the only reason I am Rabbi Yoshua with all my brilliance is because I'm ugly. If I would be a handsome man, I would not be here. You wouldn't talk to me as a rabbi. So he said to him, why, cannot be both? He said, yes, but it wouldn't be the same. The only reason I became who I am because I had no desire to go and make sins. Who would I go? Everywhere I go, they will kick me out. No one would want me. So I got stuck in only one option in my life, to be smart. Nothing else. I'm not charismatic, handsome, people enjoy to look at me, and I'm, I'm not the type to go and show myself, you know, what am I going to do? All I have to do is learn all my life. So I became who I became thanks to my ugliness. <laughs> do you understand? I'll give you another example. There was one Gabai in Shul. Gabai is in charge of the money. 20 years he was a Gabai. And one time they replaced the Rabbi. They replaced the Rabbi. And the new Rabbi that came said to the Gabai, bring me the, the, the book of all the calculations of the donations and expenses of the shul. The Gabai said to the Rabbi, there's no book. Everything over here, it's in my head. The Gabai said, what? Tomorrow someone would ask us what we do with the money of the shul. You have nothing written? He said, I don't know how to read and write. I don't know. I'm an, an alphabet. I'm not, you know, I don't know how to write. So the rabbi said to him, listen, listen, I'm sorry. We need a gabai that have a book. Every, I want everything to be documented. So he said, but I can't. He said, okay, we have to fire you. We'll give you compensation money, and you go do something with your life. You cannot be in a gabai while I'm the rabbi. So they fired him. They gave him X amount of money. He doesn't know what to do. So he came to his rabbi, he said, Rabbi, I have this hundred thousand dollars they gave me after 20 years I work here. What should I do? He said to him, in the middle between this town to the next town, right in the middle, buy a lot and build a motel over there. All the people that come, they get stuck, snow, rain, this, they need a place to sleep. There's no place to eat on the road. People are tired. They want to park their horses. They want to go in to rest. You can make fortune. Your hotel will always be full. He got exactly what the rabbi told him. He built the motel and it's packed. Business is booming. So he started to make fortune. Now he has tons of money. The banker came to him and said, how come you never put your money in the bank? Invest the money with us. We're going to make you interest on your money. You're going to make 10% on your money. Why are you hiding it in the, in the ground? So he came to the bank. If you put the money for two years, we're going to give you this much. If you put it for five years, we're going to give you... Three. So he said, okay, I agree. Okay, sign here, sign here. He said, I'm sorry, I don't know how to write. You have to take my word for it. It's good. He said, no, we have to read everything. You have to sign. I don't know how to read, and I don't know how to write. He said to him, so how, how you became such a rich man? He said to him, the only reason I'm rich... It's because I'm ignorant. Because I don't know how to read and I don't know how to write. If I would know how to read and write, I would be Gabai cleaning the bathroom in the shul until the day I died. <laughs> now because I'm an ignorant fool, I became a millionaire. <laughs> the other way around. It happens many times. Many, many times. If you open up your eyes, see, that's what's going on. I once met a person like this that have 20 sneaker stores, leather jackets, sneakers, and jeans, and he didn't know how to sign his name in English. Yes, Israeli guy. All these years in America, even to sign his name in English, he didn't learn. <laughs> how can it be? 
people do things for him. It worked. Hashem wanted him rich. He became rich. Going back to what we started, we have, God gave us a month before the, the judgment day, before Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah, it's a holiday, but it's not a picnic. You eat, you dress, okay. But you have to remember, today I'm being judged. My next year is going to be determined based on the tshuva, the repentance that I made before the judgment start. But if I didn't even know it's the judgment day, obviously I did not make tshuva, I did not make repentance, because I didn't know I'm being judged. No one told me I have a trial. How would you expect me to prepare for the trial if I didn't even know that I have a trial, right? So now I'm letting you know, in case you didn't know, there are 72 hours to the judgment moment. Every one of us, whether you like it, whether you don't like it, whether you believe in it, whether you don't believe in it, that's nonsense. doesn't matter what you believe or what you like. That's reality. How do we know? We have Torah. How do we know the Torah is divine? Watch my film. I brought you some films. Torah and science. Watch it. After you watch it, you will never have a doubt. I even brought you in Persian for your parents. In, per in Persian. Not that I speak Persian. They mute my voice. They put a professional Iranian <laughs> talk, you know, speaker, to make it 100% professional. Even Muslims from Iran sends me letters from Tehran, Isfahan, Shiraz, that you shook my entire faith in Islam. <laughs> <laughs> Why? After they saw the mistakes in the Quran that I yeah. show over there, some of them are clever to understand why would I waste my whole life on a book that has such ridiculous human errors in it. It can never be given by God. They open up their eyes, especially the intelligence one. In Iran, you have two different kinds of people. You have the intellectuals, which they're more open-minded, and then you have the very primitive one. No matter what you show them, they're still going to kill you. It's not going to help. Here, Muhammad, Muhammad, and finish. No, they don't care. Facts, deep, nothing. That's the way they raise them, finish. But some of them are open-minded. They ask, they argue, they try to answer. And at one point, they give up. I don't have any more time to do it. Back in the time, I used to answer their emails. Now I just give them sources, listen to this, watch this, goodbye. You understand? And believe it or not, many of them, I even had a computer engineer of Al-Qaeda living in Pakistan, begged me to help him to get a visa for his family to come to America to convert and live like a religious Orthodox Jew. In Al-Qaeda, computer engineer in Ubin Laden even. I even have an email that he sent me a picture of him and his family in a beautiful villa in Pakistan. And he asked me a question that I will never forget. He told me, I'm already living like a Jew from your lectures, but I cannot put your kind of yarmulke on. Because <laughs> where I live, even the women goes with machine guns. <laughs> if they see I put this black yarmulke on, they'll kill my whole family. When I have this white Muslim yarmulke, is it good also? Oh, I must have yarmulke like this. But if it's good, don't worry. That's not, no problem. But to show you how powerful this film is, once you watch it, you don't have any more doubts. You would know there is a God. The Torah is 100% from Him. The written and the oral Torah. And you will know there's life after death. You would understand that every second here is a test you would understand right away that there is reward and punishment for every one of our actions, there are consequences. Again, whether we agree, whether we like it, whether we disagree, that's not relevant. When I go to the court, they want to give me a fine for driving fast. Do you think the judge care if I agree or not? <laughs> if I agree with the law or not? I think the law is very stupid. You have to drive 50 on the Palisades Parkway. It's to rob the people. There's no question about it. Who can drive 50 in such a highway? It's crazy. You know, even you're 100 years old, you drive faster. But they do it to get people to lose money. That's why they do it. So before, because I disagree with the law, the judge would care about it. Any kind of arguments I would make, tell me, sir, that's the law. Goodbye. Pay the fine, points, insurance raise, that's it. That's the way it goes. Same thing Torah. We have the law. 
Nobody asked us, Hashem didn't ask me or you, come be my partner in a court of heaven. I want to hear your opinion. Maybe I should modify some of the laws in the 21st century. Maybe I won't give such punishment to those who break my Shabbat. After all, the synagogue is very far. It's not like it used to be. Maybe we'll change the Torah. The opposite. The Torah say this Torah will never be changed ever. No matter how modern the world would be, no matter now we have cars and airplanes and all kinds of things who change the entire world with computers, the Torah never ever changed by a bit. The punishment of a person who breaks Shabbat is still that penalty. Today, just like it was 3,000 years ago. Nothing changed. The Torah said, don't create fire. Same thing back then, same thing today. And don't ever dare to say, Rabbi, back then people wanted fire. They had to take two rocks. And it took them 20 minutes until a spark would come out. And finally they made fire. So it was a very hard work on Shabbat. Hashem didn't want people to work so hard. But today we just press a button and we have fire. That's not a job. Please don't be naive and ignorant to make this foolish, stupid claim. Because back then there was no electricity. And everyone had in their houses holes, which they have barrels of oil, full of lights, you know, because they need light. So there was always many, many candles around the house to put light. How are they going to learn? How are they going to eat? How are they going to see each other? They don't have electric like this, modern. So they had tons of fire all the time. They never needed to create new fire. There was not one second in their life they didn't have existing fire. If you have existing fire, you take from here and you light here. You don't need to take rocks every two minutes when you want light. Stupid. But the professor in Hebrew University, that's what he taught us. Why? To convince the people today, you don't have to worry. The Torah said, do not create fire. That means you cannot start the car, you cannot create fire, and even these light bulbs is fire. And if you want to argue with that, the argument will, finish, will be finished in 20 seconds. You will hold it for 20 seconds. If you go on fire, I'm right. If not, you are right. That's it. Fair deal or no? Hold it for 20 seconds. We'll see if you go on fire or not. It's fire in a metal. Different ways. Even some of the things have a doubt. Maybe it's fire, maybe not. Who, who can be brave to take such a risk? If the punishment of Mechalel Shabbat is death penalty, I'm going to take a risk to argue if it's fire or not? I'm not going to take any risk. Why? My life is on a line here. Better not to light. I live without it. I, I light it before Shabbat and leave it on or with the timer. Why? Taking a risk. Even some things that are questionable today after 3,000 years. Fine, there are some questionable, questionable areas. But because it's such a strict law, it's the agreement with God that the Jewish nation made, it's Shabbat. Halel Shabbat, it's someone who makes Shabbat Yom Chol. It's breaking the covenant between us and God. You think it's a joke? How many people here in this room knew that according to the book of God, the punishment of a Jew that doesn't keep Shabbat is greater than the punishment of a murderer? How many people knew about it? Anyone here knew about it? Look how many people are here. Now one of them knew about it. No. Do you understand what ignorance is? How many of you knew that every time... Now again, I'm not expecting your logic and your understanding to agree with me. I understand where you come from. I understand how they raise you. I understand that you did not grow up in Mea Sha'arim and in Yerushalayim. I understand. But... At the same time, I, I count on your intelligence to understand one thing. I'm not making the rules. So my opinion and your opinion, it's totally not relevant. Whether I agree with that, whether I disagree with that, whether you agree with that, that's nothing to do with our opinion. There is a book. It was given in a public event. Millions of people heard Moshe and God speaking. And then he brought down the book and they started to read about all the miracles that happened to them. If none of the miracles happened, they would raise their hand and say, excuse me, Mr. Moshe, you're giving us a book from God and it's full of mistakes. We were not in Egypt. We were not slaves. God did not split the ocean for us. We don't have man falling. 
we didn't hear the voice of God. It says over here we heard the voice of God. We didn't hear. There's lies in the book. How millions agreed to accept the book and change their entire lifestyle from one side to another? Everyone will want to be free. Who one rules? You're not allowed, you're allowed. You're not allowed, you're allowed. You have to give charity. You cannot walk on Shabbat. You cannot marry this woman. You cannot do this. You cannot do that. Who wants that? Everyone wants to be free. No one wants a boss. No one wants a constitution that limits his actions. It's natural. People want to be free. I, I'll decide what to do. Don't tell me what to do. This is the human nature. How millions of people all became religious? Until 200 years ago, you couldn't find a Jew that is not religious all over the world. Everywhere you go. Look at the black and white picture from hundreds of years. In every country. Do you think 250 years ago you had one Persian in Iran that was not Shomer Shabbat? You're dreaming. For, for more than 2,000 years, every Persian Jew was 100% ultra, ultra righteous orthodox. Even in the time of Megillat Esther, they were all Persians. Mordechai and Esther, in the time of Ahasuerus and Amman, about 2,400 years ago, Haman came to Ahasuerus and he said to him, there's a strange nation. Everything about them is strange. They dress different than us. They speak different language. Their religion is different than us. Let me get rid of them. So if the Jews would be like today in America, what's the difference between them and the Goim? Same exact thing. They dress like the Goim, they eat like the Goim, their names is like the Goim, they behave like the Goim, and they marry the Goim. Haman couldn't make the claim today to Obama. He would come to Barak and say, Dear Barak, there is a weird nation. They all dress different, they all behave different, they all have different names, they have different language, they have different religion. Let me get rid of them. So Obama would tell him, which nation are you talking about? He would say to them, the Jews. So Obama would say, I don't understand. I met hundreds of Jews in my life. I, didn't, I did not see one difference between me and them. We both went to Harvard. We both eat pork with cream on it. We both marry whoever we wanted. We both do whatever we want. I, I don't see a difference between me and my Jewish advisors. What's the difference between me and them? We walk, and we walk sometimes on the weekend, and we eat the same places, and we, our names is the same, and we, uh, we believe in the same democracy and ideology. I, I really don't see a difference between me and all the Jews I met. But in Iran, back then, when a man came to Ahasuerus, right away he knew, because all the Jews were all religious. <laughs> you understand? Until 200 years ago, everyone was religious, also in Europe. The question is, how the Jews all became religious? Well, they were all stupid? They all agree well, all of a sudden in one speech to become religious? The answer is because they heard Moshe speaking to God, and right the way they got a book to confirm it. If it didn't happen, they would say to Moshe, there is a human error in a book. It says that we heard you speaking to God. We didn't hear you speaking to God. The fact they all agree to follow the book, confirms that all the miracles that the Torah described happened to them. If one of them didn't happen, they would never agree to accept the book. It's not from God. God doesn't make lies. God doesn't make human error and mistakes. God remember what happened a, a day ago, two days ago. If God says here that yesterday we all heard you speaking to him, and we know we didn't hear you, why would he write such a lie in the Torah? Everybody heard and everyone changed, and everyone followed, and until 200 years ago, that's the way the Jews were. There's no such thing, secular court, Jewish judges, Jewish lawyers, Jewish, nothing. They were all religious, like in Yemen. In Yemen, never, it never changed. The Jewish, the Yemenite Jews, never in the history of Yemen, one of them was Mechalel Shabbat. Never, until today. Ever, for 2,600 years, you did not have one Yemenite Jew in Yemen that broke Shabbat. At least not in the public. And whenever they have delegation, they never go to the court of Yemen. It was always to the Mori, to the rabbi. Even if they would try to go to the court, they would send them to the Mori. You're not allowed to come to the court. You have to go to the rabbi, to the Yemenite Mori. That's how it was. Most of the Jews who grew up here in America, or in Israel, or in Europe, they do not know 1% of 1% of 1% of 1% of 1% until tomorrow of Judaism. Do you hear me? Take 100%, take 1% out, that's already nothing. 
right away 99. But from that 1%, take again 1%. Another 99%. So how much you have now? 0.01%. Right? From that, take again 1%. How much you have now? Six zeros. Take again 1%. What is it? Basically zero. Nothing. Ask most of the Jews who was the wife of Abraham Avinu, they don't know. Who was, what age he died, what age she died, who was their children, who is Agar, who is Noah, what is the flood. Things that in kindergarten, Jews in yeshiva, they don't know. They made a test in Israeli Knesset. Ariel Sharon was the prime minister. They brought a conversion test into the Israeli Knesset because they were arguing about the, how difficult the test is. Do you know how many questions the test had? 50 questions. Very basic questions. To pre-1A, kids in yeshiva, five years old, they would get 100 on a test. Five years old in yeshivot here in New York or in Israel. All the Israeli Knesset fell, include Sharon. Do you know what were the questions? And what mountain the Jewish nation received the Torah from God? Who are the three fathers and the four mothers of the Jewish nation? Ha, uh, what country the Jews used to be slaves before they went to freedom? How many mitzvot the Torah has? All kinds of questions, mamash, to, to kindergarten. <laughs> and Ariel Sharon got up. It's outrageous! Such a difficult test you give to the converts! <laughs> and the religious people in the Knesset, they didn't know if to, to laugh or to cry. That's the level of our leaders. So what do you expect from the nation? Rabotai, if we won't learn, we will fail. If we will fail, it's not that you fail a test and you're not going to be a doctor, so maybe you'll be a businessman. No big deal. Thank God I didn't become a doctor. Especially now with health insurance, they cut everything. It's not worth to be a doctor anymore. So, I, why are you rich? Because I didn't become a doctor. I failed the last test. Back in the time, why are you rich? Because I became a doctor. Today, why are you poor? Because I became a doctor. The health insurance gave me $20 profit. You know, that's what's going on now. I hear the doctors complaining to me what happened to them in the last few years since Obama came with his brilliant plan. Things went not so great. So people would pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for college and medical school and tons of money for insurance. In the end, they build the insurance on a shot that they give. It cost them $78. The insurance sent them $79. I have a friend, his wife is a doctor. We make one dollar on a shot. They agree to give us one dollar. What are we going to do? We tell the patient we don't give you the shot. He needs the shot now. That's his insurance. Without it, he doesn't have money. This Hasid. That's the health insurance yet. What are we going to do now? The time we have to waste on him in the office and this. and that. For one dollar profit. That's it. So the idea, Rabotai, is if we want to learn we will fail. If we'll fail, there will be an eternal consequences. I hope you're clever enough to understand what it means without going into details. Therefore, what's the solution? There's only one solution. Let's start learning Torah. How do you start? First film you watch, Torah and Science. Then you have a CD I brought you here, The Purpose of Life. Then you have CD number one in English. 30 hours of basic information that it's critical for the life of a Jew. You must hear it. I will explain to you what Shabbat is, why it's so important, why the punishment of Mechalel Shabbat is worse than the punishment of a murderer. How can it be? Every person you ask in the world to murder is a despicable act or no, everyone would say yes, except ISIS. They said, depend who you kill. But most people, when you ask them to murder someone, just like this, on the street, what? someone walks in the street to come and kill him. It's a crime? Most people would agree. You ask the Jewish people, someone that drives a car on Shabbat is a criminal? Criminal? It's a very nice guy. What criminal? But in the book of God it said not to create fire, it's death penalty. <coughs> Worse than a penalty of a murderer. 
I don't believe in it. Why he doesn't believe in it? Because he doesn't want it to be true. Is it going to change reality? If a person, that his doctor say to him, if you're going to drink this drink for another year or so, you're going to get cancer. That cause cancer. It's been proven. I don't believe you, doctor. Don't drink. I don't believe you, doctor. He cares if he believes him or not. That's reality. Yes. While we were touching on this uh, most important subject, Shabbat, and I wanted to be a little bit uh, awakening for the audience here. Uh, I think that you say exactly what it says in the Torah, and Torah is written by Hashem. It says, Mechal Shabbat Motumad. You translate it. Some people may think to themselves two things come in their mind, which often happened to me. Some people think to me, say, okay, I'm Shomer Shabbat, but I see other people who are in Chas Shalom. Nothing happened to them. Ah. That's one thing comes into his mind. So, he, he, you know, you might Good say question. That, yeah, What's the next might, one? The might, next point. Yeah. Yeah. Another, another people might think to themselves that, why is it that Hashem really doesn't want me to have anything to do with energy creating stuff on this day? In particular, fire or lights or cars or oh. anything like that. What is he going to go in the pocket of Hashem that I'm not Very in? good. Does he love me or not? You Does he want me to go to shul? I cannot sweat and go in the rain and, you know, go crazy. Let me sit in the beautiful car that is created today, turn on the air condition, look at, you know, normal human being, and I go, I do such a dovening. I get so close to him. What does he want me to become wet and sweating and go there? What does Hashem have to do with me? These are the things that goes in the mind of the Jews these days a lot, and they are missing out the beautiful Shabbat that if they observe it, they're going to have the fun, they're going to have a beautiful feeling, and it's impossible for those who are observing Shabbat to ever express this to the ones, their loved ones, who are not. You brought up two good points, and I'll address both of them. The, first of all, the second point that you made, we don't have the ability to be in the same level of the mind of God to understand what he does and why he wants this, this is to be this way and this to be that way. We don't have it. So right away we have to understand that with the relationship that we have between us and our creator, we have to understand our limitation and just follow his instructions exactly as he said. But some of the things we do understand and the reason why Shabbat is very important is because Hashem created the world in six days and in the seventh day He rested completely. He did not create. He created everything in six days. The seventh day, nothing was created. And He said to His children, I'm making a covenant between you and me today. You are my representative in the world. By you, working and doing all your errands and work and learning, whatever you do during the, in the six days, and then you stop on a seven. No business, no opening stores, no diving, no riding on horses, no riding, none of these things that you're not allowed to do on Shabbat. When you stop, all the Jews all over the world, they all stop, they go in, they all ask, why you don't do business on the seventh day? Why you don't cook on the seventh day? Why you don't ride on a horse on the seventh day? Why are you all doing all these strange things on Shabbat? automatically when they get their answers, you spread the fact that the world is not a random explosion or evolution or something that, you know, by, by accident happened. There is a creator, there is a purpose, and this is how it was done. So you have an opportunity to be like a little god, to be like me. I did everything in six days and seven days I rested. I wanted you to be the same. Six day you create, one day it's a spiritual day. Plus, by that you're gaining being with your family, resting from all the stress. A person needs a day of rest. You know, be constantly under stress. Disconnect from the electric, disconnect from driving, from traffic, from anger, from arguments, from telephone calls. A day for the family, day for your children, day for learning. They to come to play together with the community, to eat well, to rest, to sleep, to take a walk. There's a lot of advantages on Shabbat. Now going back to your first question. Many people drive on Shabbat or do other things and they leave. They leave to 90, more even. The answer is, the Torah already told us that the punishments of God are not instant. Same thing, the reward. 
you don't get rewarded when you do something good immediately and you don't get punished immediately. The reason you don't get the effect of your actions done right away is because if this is the way God would make the world, the world would not, will defeat his purpose. It will defeat the purpose of the creation. Why? The purpose of the creation is to test us. As the Torah says in few places, I'm testing you to see what's in your heart. Would you keep my mitzvot or not? That's why I'm strict with you. It's all a test. Or sometimes I'm torturing you to see will you love me and be faithful to me or not? And why I'm testing you? To reward you in your end. When you die, the reward will begin. It's a clear verses in the Torah. So every second I'm testing you. Ki menaseh Hashem etchem. Lirot atishmor mitzvotayim lo. Every second of your life I'm testing you. Would you pass the test? Would you fail? Would you pass? Would you fail? And constantly I'm reviewing you and recording you. And this is how life is. So now, if that's the purpose of life, to be righteous, not to be wicked, but we have a free choice to do whatever we want, imagine a person would light a cigarette on Shabbat for the first time. After God gave us the Torah, and he said to us, don't create fire. And now one person would put cigarette in his mouth, light a match, <laughs> explosion. He, he became... Smoke. Dust. Explosion. Oh, Moshe, where are you? It gadal with kadash merabai. Then an hour later, another guy, Isaac, put a cigarette in his mouth, light a cigarette, psh, also died. What would happen after that? From this moment on until the end of days, all the Jews, as soon as Shabbat comes, even an hour before, they would stand like this. Moshe, come help me out. Shh, I don't move. Why? By accident, I touch fire. I move. Don't want to move. Come, we need help. No, don't, don't touch. Everyone would stand like this. Be careful. Fire, electric. Why, why, why? Why? Nobody wants to die. Not because it's the right thing to do. That's not a test. If, a, if I take a secular atheist and I put a gun to his head, let's see you lighting a cigarette on Shabbat. <laughs> let's see you. He will be Shomer Shabbat better than me. Not because he believes it's the right thing to do. He doesn't want to get killed. So what, where is the test here? Of course with the gun. Take your kid and tell him, if you're going to touch it, I'm going to take away your bike. Why he doesn't touch the chocolate? He believes that it's the wrong thing to do? No. He believes it's the right thing to do? No. He doesn't want to lose his bike. That's not a test. Sometimes you see the children behave great. Why? They have a father that is crazy. If they won't behave well when the guests leave, he's going to torture them with a the whip. They already know. Don't mess with this crazy wacko. So that's why they all behave like in England. How do you do, sir? Why? They have a crazy father. He's going to lock them in a, I don't know where. So that, that's not education. As soon as they'll be free, there will be monster murderers, maybe, exploding. Why? Finally, the leash was released. That's not education, that's not a test, that's not nothing. Same thing, if a person would write a check to the rabbi, to the yeshiva, he rabbi, a thousand dollars, or for CDs. He gives them a donation, a minute later, double was wired to his account. He gave another thousand to a poor person, pop, he made another two thousand. So let's try five. He gave five, he, write, he made ten. He gave ten, he made twenty. What would he do now? Take every penny he has, even the chandelier he would sell. Why? I'm doubling the money every two minutes. Uh, who would ever make such money? Even Warren Buffett did. <laughs> he makes 12% a year, they say, on his money. <laughs> this is every two seconds you would double your money. Even the Nazis and the Arabs would come to the yeshiva to throw their money in. Rabbi, catch! <laughs> Why? They became believers of Torah? No, they want to double their money. If a person would steal, he just stole a million, immediately he lost two million. Like the Torah says, you lose double. Where would be the test? If people that are Mechalel Shabbat will die right away, no one would ever be Mechalel Shabbat. The whole point is, there is a book of God and God is not a liar. And he say, when you die, that will be the final trial. 
for your entire life, and that's when I decide what to give you as reward or as a punishment. However, if you have Torah here, I can read to them the Pasuk, if you have a Chumash, Mechila. It's, it's written in the end of Parashat Vait Hanan. That's Parashat Vait Hanan. It's written over there, I am the zealous God, the strict God. I'm paying my lovers that keep my mitzvot. Who is my lover? Not someone that kiss the mezuzah ten times a day. You know how many people I know that kiss the mezuzah and there's not one good thing they do in their life besides this? Stealing, robbing, <laughs> raping, halal shabbat, lying all day, cheating the customers, torturing his wife. Uh, what is it going to help now? He comes to the synagogue, to the paroche, like this. What's the point? Thank you. Mechila. So, it's written here, I am the zealous God that pay my lovers that keep my mitzvot for thousand generations. ומשלם לרשע אל פניו לאבידו. And I'm paying the wicked people cash to their face to get rid of them. I will not delay the reward. I will pay them directly to their cash, to their face, cash to get rid of them. Meaning, according to this, it says in the Torah, it says in the Torah, it's written in the Torah that those who love me and keep my mitzvot, I keep the reward for a thousand generations. Meshalem le'ohavai le'shomrei mitzvotai le'elef dor. Thousands of generations. And what about the enemies? ומשלם לשונאי אל פניו לאבידו. לא האחר לשלם לו. I will not delay his reward to the wicked people. I will pay them cash to their face to get rid of them. Now I'll ask you a question. First of all, why to pay wicked people to begin with בכלל? Why do they deserve a reward? The answer, even the most wicked Jews in history, they made few mitzvot in their life. ברית מילה. He has mezuzot in his house sometimes. Here and there he eats kosher. Once or twice in his life he answers a man. In his bar mitzvah he put fill in for the pictures. You know. So he did few mitzvot in his life, no? Few. Maybe he saw a poor person, he bought him falafel. Once in his life he did something good. He was in a good mood. You know, maybe one time his friend and his wife had a fight, so he made peace between them. All together in the 78 years of life, even the most atheist person, he does mitzvot. Holiday here, holiday there, here, kiddush here. Few things he did in his life. How Hashem is going to give him reward? He doesn't have a share to the world to come. He cannot go to heaven. It's Mechanel Shabbat. He's doing horrible things. He doesn't eat kosher. He doesn't put filin. He doesn't pray. He's not an honest person. He cannot go to heaven, someone like that. But he has to get paid for the few mitzvot he did in his life. He gets paid in this life. House here, a house there, a car here, a wife here, another wife, this, that, children here, children there, lawyer, doctor, all these dreams. Baseball team, football team. Life is end, and he has nothing left. He comes to the court of heaven, but I did this, but I did that, you got paid. I gave, what do you think, I gave you a 10 million dollar home because you have beautiful eyes? Well, why do you think I gave you such a house? Because for this mitzvah, for this, for that, for that, you got paid. Yeah, but I also did this. Okay, now very nice. For that, you have three children. Many people don't have children. I gave you three children. Okay, but I also, do th I also did this. You had five cars. All together, 50 cars in your life. I don't know you anything. You know how many people never had one car in their life? And this I did. You got this, and you got that, and you got that. Everything, a person will go crazy. That's it, so I have nothing left. You have nothing left. Now you have to go and pay for all your sins. It's very painful and very long. Sometimes a person will get another chance, reincarnation. The soul will be put in a new baby that is born, and Hashem put him in a different place, different parents, and he has another chance. We all, by the way, are reincarnations. You can know who you used to be in your previous life by hypnosis. 
you go to parapsychologist, he hypnotizes you. It's called regression. It's scientific. You can see it in the video. He takes you back on time. He speaks to your subconscious, not to your conscious, meaning directly to your soul. The soul records everything that happened to you, not only in this life, every beep you heard, every image you saw, everything you ever, ever experienced in this life or was around you, to the smallest detail. Somebody hung on the street, across the street. You didn't even pay attention. You are busy with something, with a conversation. When they will hypnotize you, you'll be able to tell exactly what second the, the, the beep was. If I ask you right now, you won't know. Only through hypnosis you will know. Because right now you're answering from the conscious. But I penetrate your subconscious and get the information from there and then the cameras and the recordings are working constantly. But the interesting thing is that it's not only from this life, also from previous life everything is recorded. Although the soul came from one body to another, it still has all the information from previous life. So if right now you're American, you're born in America, you speak only English, I sent you back 50 years ago before you were born, all of a sudden you speak Farsi. Where are you from Tehran? And you describe your life. And you're asking him about dates. Where are you now? August 12, 1960. I'm walking here in this street, I have a meeting. And he speaks in Farsi accent, different voice. And then you say, okay, let's go back another 50 years. Now it was somebody else. All of a sudden, it speaks in the voice of a woman. See a man, and a woman begins to talk. What? French. What's your name? Jacqueline. Where are you from? France. Paris. Paris. What's your job? I have a, I'm a florist. I sell flowers. It's, it's crazy. You see all the stations of the soul from one body to another. By the way, in case you didn't know, when a person is born, he brings into this world things from his previous life. As results of his previous life, Hashem decides how to design him. For instance, if you see a woman, she was born very pretty. And somebody else the same day in the hospital was born very ugly. Why would God make one woman very pretty and the other woman very ugly? Why? Is it coincidence? He has a Russian roulette. He turns the roulette. Oh, it fell on beauty. Throw it to the basket. Let's roll it again. Short. Sorry. Short. Roll it again. Skinny. Got lucky. Skinny. Don't have to have, you don't have to have diets. Next thing. Roll it again. Welt. Okay, welt. Roll the dice again. What is the, that, that's how Hashem designed people? What about the biological, uh, the parents, if the parents are pretty, the baby's pretty. Uh, very little we saw the baby comes from a pretty parents. Okay. You know, you're very clever. <laughs> you've, I have to admit, you're very clever, but the Torah is more clever than you. <laughs> and the Torah already thought about your questions before you were born. <laughs> and when Hashem wants a, a person to come back to the life and he needs to be wealthy, he puts him by wealthy parents. If he needs to be poor, he puts him by poor parents. If he needs to be pretty, he puts him by a handsome man and a pretty woman. If he needs to be ugly, he puts him by two, you know what. And you understand what's going on? So base, that's why Hashem is making matching. And also the location. It's very important where he will be born. It's a whole different test if he's born in Great Neck or if he's born in, Great, in Bnei Brak. Whole different test. Born in Bnei Brak, all Haredim, Hasidim, Torah everywhere. He born here in Middle Neck Road, Shabbat, Bentley, all the show of... A whole different test. He raised like that and he raised in Bnei Brak. It's a whole different design. Hashem wanted him to be in such a place. From here I want you to be tzaddik. From here. Not when you're in Mea Sharim. Mea Sharim, it's easy. Everyone is like this. It's easy. Easy to be religious in places like this. You just don't know any other way. Monsi, Lakewood, Boropa, much easier. Not anymore, by the way. With the internet, it messed up everything. But before internet, that's the way it was at least. You're born in Mea you're tzaddik, that's it. Everyone around you is tzaddikim. Torah, yeshivot, kdusha, shabbat, rebez. Today with the internet, it breaks the boundaries. But you get the point. 
Now, if a person, why would a woman come one pretty and one ugly? Did you ever think about it? A woman that in her previous life, she already passed the test of modesty. Passed it, that's it. She doesn't have to be tested again about it. She has other tests, maybe laziness, maybe selfishness, maybe other things, maybe fate. But modesty, she passed already. She doesn't have desire anymore to show herself in the public and to make scenes. Why? Her nature is, she's very solid, naturally she's modest. Therefore Hashem didn't make her so pretty, not to make her want to show her face in every magazine. Because that's not her test in life. The other one that died very not modest in her previous life, all she did is sin with a man and showing and all kinds of things. Since she did not fix it, she's getting another chance. The only way she's going to have a test, if she's going to have what to show. She has nothing to show what kind of a test she's going to have. She's not going to have confidence to go make sins. So he gives her something that she thinks how lucky I am, everyone after me. But she doesn't know that this gift, supposedly, could be chas v'shalom, the worst curse. It's all depend if she passed the test or fell. Wisdom. Hashem gives wisdom to a person. Why? He expecting to be Rav Uvadia Yosef or Rav Eliashiv. But this person, instead of using the wisdom for holiness, he used it to be a professor in St. John's University to teach the students that they came from the monkey. So instead of teaching Mara, he teach the theory of Darwin this Jewish brilliant professor. So the gift that God gave him was his poison, was his cancer. That's, that what, that's what's going to destroy this next world. So the gift, it can, can only be a gift if you did the right thing with that, what Hashem expects you to do. If Hashem gave you hundreds of millions of dollars, why did he give you so much? How much a person need to live comfortably? How much? Yes, a five million dollar home. No, another vacation home, two million. Few cars, another half a million. No, what else? Half a million dollar a year to live like a king. Here you go. So how much all together? 20 million, fine. Why is another 500 million? To buy mitzvot with that. With another 400 million that he has, he doesn't even know what to do with that. What, is, what he can do? He can support yeshivot. He can take child, Jewish children from public school and put them in yeshivot and save their souls. He can sponsor CDs and making a lot of Jews Shomre Shabbat. He can help the widows, the poor. He can buy billions and trillions of mitzvot. But what does he do, the fool? What does he do? Buy a yacht in Madrid. I bought a yacht. 25 million dollar foreclosure. How many times is going to go to the yacht? Months or twice in his life. He's going to stand over there. He's going to pay $50,000 a year to store it. Why did he buy it? Show off. Show off. Why his wife need a $10,000 jacket? $500 jacket, jacket is not pretty enough. I promise you it's pretty enough. Why? Let's burn. We have. But why not to buy mitzvot with that? With this jacket you can save 100 Jews and make them Shomrei Shabbat. 100 souls with this stupid $10,000 coat. Or the $500 uh, whatever. You know? You got the point. The point is that even when you make fortune, is a, is a very big test. The Gemara asks this question, what's better, to be rich or poor? None, the Gemara say. Better to be average, meaning pay the bills, living okay, that's it. What? Better than to become Bill Gates? Yes. Why? When you're very poor, your test is you may steal. You don't have to pay, your children are starving. Stress in the house, your wife go crazy, cannot afford anything. You begin to steal from your boss or from someone else or from the store. It's a very difficult test. Poor people sometimes steal. It's a fact. Not because they want to steal. They don't have faith in Hashem that it's all a test. And they cannot handle the test. They feel bad for the wife or the children. They go and they steal. When a person is very wealthy, what's his test? to give tons of charity. And most of the rich people give nothing. Nothing. Compared to how much they make. Don't be impressed when you see a rich person give a million dollars to a building because he wants his name on a building. He only does it for his honor. 
He won't give you a penny without the name on a building. It's only that his name will be on a building. Nothing for the Torah, nothing for the, for the, for the learning, and nothing for the rabbi, and nothing for anything. Just for his name. One person told me, I'll give you a million dollars. You have a building? I said, no, I don't waste money on buildings. Chaval, what are you building for? We operate without building. Why? Why? To burn a million dollars, we can make a hundred thousand ballet tshuva with a million dollars. We just made, gave a, a million cities in Israel. Thousands of people became religious. Thousands of people. Million dollars, I would make three, four hundred thousand Shomrei Shabbat with a million dollars. I will spend it on a building. Why? No, I need, <laughs> I'll never forget it. Nobody, I need something to put my wife and my name on. I said, we're going to put your name on the CDs. Ah, come on. <laughs> Meaning, buy a building, I'll give you the money. So I'm going to take the money from him to have a nice building. To come, do you see? Okay, I have secretaries. Well, what can we do for you? Burn a million dollars on a building. You understand? Yeshiva needs building. Synagogue needs building. Kiruv doesn't need building. You don't need, you can manage with that. You operate out of your home, you have few assistants, they work from their homes. Today with the electronic, you don't need any more offices. Secretary part-time, it's good enough. Why burning money? Why burning money on things that is not so necessary? Before we finish, I just want to conclude the main thing when we are now three days before Rosh Hashanah. The main thing now is to repent. But to repent, that means to, to leave the sin. To be ashamed, to regret, to confess. Once Yom Kippur come, it cleans it. Some sins require suffering. Every time the sin says in the Torah, the soul will be cut out of my nation, such as Mechalel Shabbat, idol worshiper, someone who eats on Yom Kippur, eats chametz on Pesach. There's a list of 36 restrictions on the Torah from the 613 commandments. 36 of them are extremely severe. That there's, besides the death penalty, there's also a cut for the soul. That it says, I'm cutting that soul out of my nation for eternity. When he dies, that's it. He's, he's cut from God. Cut, cut. Separate, like a get, like a divorce. I have nothing to do with you anymore. Forever and ever, for eternity. Why? Because he's Mechalel Shabbat. He did not keep the covenant that we made. So if somebody did tshuva, Hashem canceled the cut. But there is a price. What's the price? Besides the shame, besides the regret, besides the confession, besides Yom Kippur, besides leaving the sin, of course, he must receive suffering. What kind of suffering? It's negotiable. If it's a person that now became religious, he learns a lot of Torah, he helps in a synagogue, he gives a lot of tzedakah, he does a lot for people, that's his suffering. He doesn't need to suffer more. He gets up in the morning, he comes to the shul, summer, winter, parking. He can pray at home, easy. 20 minutes and finish. No, he comes to the shul. All these things he does. Hashem takes that effort instead of the suffering. But if he's a Mr. or Mrs. Prima Donna, become religious, but still thinking he's in a, living in illusion, he must receive suffering. Problem, money loss, lawsuits, problems with the children, wife, boss, partner, delegations, lots of headache. Suffering, finish the payment for the sins and, and complete the repentance. So we have to know one thing. The purpose of becoming or doing tshuva is to come back to Hashem, to come close with Him. Right now when we make sins, we have obstacles between us and Hashem. We cannot see His light in our life. As soon as we break the boundaries and the obstacle, we begin to feel more and more light of the Torah and the soul comes back to life. It's a spiritual, wonderful feeling. Ask Baalei Tshuva when to learn in Yeshiva, they'll tell you how wonderful is their life became. All spiritual. But... The Torah say, What does it mean, tshuva? Not from the word answer. Mean means, shuv, shuv, come back, return closer to me. 
Or right now, when you break Shabbat, you cannot be close with me. When you live with a Goya and marry her, you can never be close with me. When you steal all day, you cannot be close with me. When you curse all day, when you steal and you deceive people, you cannot be close with me. When you eat on Yom Kippur, when you watch dirty things on television or in the internet, you cannot be close with me. Because I am perfect truth. I am perfect humility. I am perfect kindness. I am perfect modesty. I am perfect in every positive thing. And you are negative in every spiritual thing. Negative and positive cannot be together. Once you purify yourself, you'll be able to be attached to me like the way your soul is craving. And what does it say? It says like this, Ikar ha-shiva b'tshuva l'itkarev l'ashem itbarach, to return to Hashem. Sh'are n'itrachek mimenu al yedei avaro. Person went far away from Hashem because of his past, because of his bad actions. Hashem, his interest is that the person would leave the scene, regret, be ashamed, and obviously become better and better in his actions. One more thing we have to know, the words of the Rambam, the biggest posek in the last thousand years in Judaism, the Rambam said something shocking, mama shocking. The Rambam says, first of all, when a person makes sins, is loved by Hashem or no? What do you think? Is it such thing that Hashem hated you? No. What do you think? Depend. Depend. When a person has a son or a daughter, naturally they love them, right? It's my son, it's my daughter, how can I hate my son, no? But what happened if the son became Adolf Hitler? Can the father love him or no? Of course not. It's going to be very difficult to love such a son, no? Don't, don't remind me about this boy. Please don't mention his name next to me. No, no, he's... He's homeless somewhere in the street. Let him die. Why? It's your son. How do you talk? The person that tried to make peace between the father and the son doesn't really know what the father went through with this monster. But when the father will find out that this boy died, this Adolf died, he will still feel pain. What does it show? There is a natural love. But right now, this love is on hold, is paused, and hate came into the picture. Real hate, not metaphoric. How do you know it? The language of the Rambam in Lchot Shuvah. The Rambam says, the Rambam says like this, Gdola Tshuvah shemekarevet et ha'adam l'shechina. To do repentance is great. It brings a person close to, the, to Hashem, to the Shechina. Sheneemar, where does it say it? Shuvah Israel ad Hashem Elokecha. Return Israel all the way to your God. Shneemar velo shavtem adai neum Hashem. You did not return yet to me. And another place it say, Im tashuv Israel neum Hashem elai tashuv. If you're going to return, you will return to me. Meaning, you will be sticking to me, attached to me. Ad shuvah mekarevet et arechokim. I'm reading to you the words of the Rambam. The tshuva takes someone who is far from Hashem and brings him closer to Hashem, spiritually. Emesh, listen now to the words of the Rambam, I will translate it to English. Emesh hayazet sanui lifnei hamakom. Yesterday he was hated by Hashem. Hated. Sanui. Sina. Sina is the worst hatred. Meshukatz, despicable. Meruchak, far away. Toava, the biggest dirt. Who is he talking about? A secular Jew, Khalil Shabbat. Graduate of Harvard, a judge of a Supreme Court, Prime Minister of Israel. What difference does it make? Shoe shine. Does it make a difference? You think Hashem cares how much money you make? He gives you the money. Everything is from him, so you're not impressing him by your titles and college degrees. Shtuyot. You are either righteous or you're wicked. That's all Hashem cares about. Rishit chokhmah irat Hashem. The wisdom begins with fear from God. 
If you fear God, you're smart. If not, you're stupid. Doesn't matter how many degrees you have. And what kind of a doctor you are. That's not impressed Hashem. Hashem is not impressed by if you have a Harvard degree or Columbia. Or you got your degree from Gaza. He doesn't care. He's only impressed if you're righteous. If you overcome your animal instinct. If you control your desires. If you are grateful. If you are kind. If you are honest. If you are merciful. If you are decent. If you are a hard-working person with devotion. If you appreciate. If you love Torah and holiness. That's what impresses Hashem. Nothing else. Not your house, not your car, not your, the beautiful wife you have. Uh, you are not going to be able to impress Hashem with this. You impress the people on the street maybe. But that's going to be a blink of the eye. You'll be gone before you enjoy this attention. So yesterday was hated, despicable, far, the biggest there, to'eva. Ve'ayom, and today, after he did tshuva, he's loved, nice, close, friend. Do you understand the difference? Before you became Shomer Shabbat, before you started to eat strictly kosher, before you started to talk to Hashem and to stop with your horrible actions, you were hated, chas v'shalom, despicable, the biggest dirt. That's the language of the greatest rabbi in the last thousand years. He brings it from the Torah. He doesn't say his own opinion here. How great is the level of repentance? Yesterday you were separated from the God of Israel, Shenemar. Avonotechem, ayu mavdelim benchem leven elokechem. Your sins separate between you and your God. It's a clear verse. Not an assumption. It's written clearly. The more sins you do, the more far away you're going to be from me. You're not going to feel my presence and my light in your life. You live like a dog. That's it. No spirituality. Screaming when he has problems. When he's sick. When his son is sick. When his wife is sick. All kinds of problems. His partner stole from him. I arrest us after him. He scream. All of a sudden he remember God. Screaming. Hashem doesn't pay attention to him. Ose mitzvot, he does few mitzvot, torfim otam befanav, Hashem blow it in his face. Not interested, don't do me a favor, kfui tova. You're ungrateful, I don't want anything from you. You're gonna do me a favor, once here you're gonna put filin by the kotel, by the chabad over there in a the boot. You have filin in a closet all here, you're not gonna put it. All of a sudden Mendel came to you, hey, hey, come here, put filin, you're, you're embarrassed from him, so you agree. And five times he look at his watch. No, when is it going to be over already? You understand? You were doing me a favor. Or saying, I'm reading to you. Don't say, please, I'm begging you. Don't say that I say. This lecture, I said nothing. Really, whatever you heard from me in the last hour or two was not one word from me. I'm only the delivery guy who brings the letter from Hashem to you. Here is the letter. I'm reading to you. That's all. I promise you, I did not add one letter to my speech that is from my opinion. Nothing. Yes, people that will hear what I say, they will have a lot to criticize. Why? They cannot handle the truth. Maybe they want your money. Maybe they want you to come to their shul. Maybe they want you to appreciate them or to admire them or whatever they want from you. I don't know. I don't want anything from you. Really, nothing whatsoever. I want you to take CDs for free. And I want you to open up your heart and your mind to listen to what I read here tonight. Three days before the judgment day will determine your next year and your next years of life. And what would happen when we leave this world? 72 critical hours. No time for movies and sport now. It's time to repent. That's it. Tomorrow is Shabbat. Tomorrow I'm keeping the last Shabbat of the year. Everything goes after the end. If the last Shabbat of the year you keep, it's like you fix the whole year. Why? It's like in a marathon. You started very good and you, in the end you got tired. You finish in the end. Nobody will remember that you have some good moments. But if you start very bad and you finish very good in the end and you're in the top, everyone remember where you finish. No one remember what was before. That's the beauty of tshuva. That now you're going to do the last year of the year. You save your entire year.
How can you refuse to such an, uh, an opportunity? Oseh mitzvot v'torfim otam b'fanav. He's doing mitzvot and Hashem is blowing it in his face. Like you bring someone an ice cream and he push it to your face. Don't do me a favor. What a big disaster. It's an embarrassment. Mi bikezot mi etchem remos chatzerai. Why are you bringing me sacrifices? I'm not interested. Your hands is full of blood and stealing. You're bringing me gifts to the temple? I'm not interested. Now he became religious. He's attached to Hashem. Shenemar v'atem advekim ba'ashem elokechem. Chaim kulchem hayom. Those who are attached to Hashem are all alive. Life of eternity. Not temporary life. The dog is also alive without being attached to Hashem. The idol worshiper in China is also alive. Well, we're not talking about this kind of life. We talk, every time the Torah uses the word Chaim means life of eternity. The life of the soul. It's all about the soul here. Tzorek v'na'ana. Now you scream to Hashem. He's enjoying to listen to you. And of course he's going to help. Before you finish the sentence, I will already accept it. I know what you're about to ask. Look how, look how the status of a person changed. Why? Not because he kissed the mezuzah. No. Just because he changed and he started to listen to Hashem. Oseh mitzvot umekablim otam benachat v'simcha. Shenemar ki kvar ratza elokim et maasecha. Not only that, Hashem is desiring your mitzvot. Mitavim lahem. Ve'arva le'ashem minchat Yehuda v'Yerushalayim. Ki me'olam u'cheshanim kadmoniot. You know what means ve'arva? Arev. You know what's arev? Arev lechiki. Person hate the best steak in the world. Ah, delicious. He feels great. Or the greatest whiskey, if he like whiskey. Wow, 37 years old. Wow, unbelievable. Drink it little by little, that the pleasure won't end. This is just a parable, an analogy. Ve'arva le'ashem, it's sweet to Hashem your mitzvot. Not like before. Because you finally became a human being. The Rambam say, Shuv ad Hashem elokecha, it's written in the Torah, Shuv ad Hashem, if you go all the way back to Hashem, you'll be attached to Him. Mamash madregat vekut, mamash, you attach to Hashem. Shiviti Hashem lenegdi tamid. One person asked, one person asked the Rebbe, I think it was the Rebbe from Kotz, Rabbi, you, the religious people, are too fanatic. Why you always write in the shul, Shiviti Hashem lenegdi tamid? How can a person think about Hashem every second of his life? Come on, don't exaggerate. There's other things in life. Now I'm thinking about the steak. Another minute I'm thinking about the show. Two minutes later about the game. Now I'm talking about the business. Now I have a minute for Hashem. I cannot think about Hashem all day, no? Is it really possible that a person would only think about Hashem? It's a lie. Take it off. Take the sign off. So the rabbi said, I will demonstrate to you how you will think about Hashem for the every second of your life. Ah, no, no, not me. He took two gorillas. Catch this guy, bring him to the lake. These two gorillas got him. Hey, what are you doing? Don't worry, the rabbi knows what he's doing. They took him to the lake. The rabbi came, he stand by the, by the water. So, you ready? Now we're going to teach you what it means to think about only one thing, nothing else. They grabbed his head, drowned him in the water. 30 seconds, trying to come out. The rabbi said, up. <gasps> Pushing him down again, like this, up, <gasps> down, up, like this, 20 minutes, up and down, <laughs> scoffing, choking, up and down. Now you can leave him. Now, of course, two, three minutes, it took him to get his breath back. And he started to scream, you rebbe, you Nazi. <laughs> the rabbi said to him, listen, my friend, you ask a question, you got your answer. I have one question for you. When you were under the water, what was the only thing you thought about? <gasps> yeah, right? Did you think about your beautiful wife? No, there was no time for it. Did you think about your lovely children, about your business, about your next real estate deal next week, about the new watch you're about to buy, 
about the car, about fixing this, about the leak you have. Did you think about anything? What did you only think about? <gasps> yeah, that's it. Right now, that's what I need. I don't need now another house, another deal. And Nothing is important right now. Right now I need air, desperately. This is how we feel when it comes to Hashem. We love Him so much. We are addicted to His brilliance and Torah so much. And once we taste from it, constantly for years, we cannot leave it for a second. Nothing can come even near it. So why would we think about something else when we have the greatest thing that the soul needs? You live in a mud, you live inside the bathroom, you got used to the horrible smell. When we take you to paradise and you smell the perfume, then you understand what you were doing in the bathroom. You got used to it. When a person is in the mud, in the dirt, he get used to the smell. Take him out and then take him back, he would not agree. Do you see in a casino? When you go inside in a hotel, the amigo, he clean the window, the, the mirrors. You come inside, you want to vomit. In the airport, same thing. Every hotel, every public bathroom is cleaning, enjoying, whistling, singing. You come in, you cannot breathe. You go like this. Horrible. Como esta, senor? Life is great. Come, come with me five minutes outside. Now bring him back. He says, ooh, he got stinkier. He didn't smell five minutes ago because was, he got used to it. When a secular person say to you, Rabbi, don't worry about me. I love my life. I love my life. You love your life. We're good. Leave me alone. Live and let live. You say to him, yeah, the person in the bathroom also think it smells great. Because he got used to it. Take him out, bring him back, let's see if he's going to be there another minute. Once you got used to the fake lifestyle and to all the lies and to all the show, of course. That's the only way you know. Come out of it for a month and then try to go back. I have a guy, I brought him from LA, 51 years old. Big businessman. He was married to the granddaughter of Menachem Begin, the Prime Minister of Israel. He's one of the superb people of the secular world of Tel Aviv in many aspects. I met him in LA, I brought him to the yeshiva in Monsi. He came to the yeshiva in Monsi for two weeks. <coughs> he went back to LA, he became so miserable there. He said to me, wow, you have no, it's like coming back to the zoo. I am counting the minutes until Rosh Chodesh Elul that I can come back to the yeshiva. Now he came Rosh Chodesh Elul, he was with me in Israel, we came together on the same flight. Rosh Chodesh Elul our, was our flight back to New York. From the airport I drove him right away to the yeshiva. Not a little kid, 51 years old, he has older kids already. He doesn't come out of the yeshiva, he doesn't check his WhatsApp messages even. He's in such paradise. From time to time he calls me up, he, say, you he screams on the phone. You don't know how every minute he is heaven in this world. I don't want to come out of here forever. Well, what does he have? A little room, a bed. Not the nice house he has in Tel Aviv or the one he has in Los Angeles. Nothing. What's yeshiva? Give you a little room. You're not a little kid. You have to sleep over there with another person in a room. You eat in the yeshiva. The yeshiva is not exactly, you know. It's in heaven. The soul is shaking from pleasure. Because the soul was made by God, and the Torah was made by God. And God said, the food of the soul is my Torah. You begin to connect to it, the feeling that you're going to have is greater than any pleasure you ever tasted in this phony world. Just taste from it. Taste! And then you understand how great is Hashem. Don't taste, how are you going to know? I will finish with one sentence. If you take all the pleasure of all the people from the day Hashem created Adam on earth until the end of time, all the people, all the generations, all kinds of pleasure you can imagine, money, vacation, art, sport, food, women, uh, you name it. All kinds of pleasure exist that people love. Of all the people over their entire 70, 80, 90 years, Every person, 
90 or 80 or 70 years of pleasure. All kinds of pleasure. It's a huge mountain of pleasure in 70, 80 years. Here, this, that, all the pleasure a person can have in life. That's one. Multiply by seven and a half billion people. Add all the people from previous generations all the way to Adam, maybe a hundred billion people. Multiply by 70, 80 years of life. You have billions of hours of pleasure. All of that will not be equal to one hour reward of a religious Jew in the afterlife. Where does it say it in the Torah? All of that combined cannot reach the pleasure of the soul for one hour in the eternal life. It will never stop for eternity. Trillions and trillions and trillions of years of pleasure. And each hour is already greater than in this entire earth. יפה שעה אחת של קורת רוח בעולם הבא מכל חיי העולם הזה. One hour in the afterlife בעולם הבא is greater than this entire world combined. From the beginning to the end of everything existed here will not be equal to one hour of the divine pleasure of the soul. What is this divine pleasure? יושבים צדיקים ועטרותיהם לראשיהם ונהנים מזיו השכינה. The righteous people have special crowns. They are in the presence of God and they enjoying the greatness of God. What does it mean? They're enjoying the greatness of God. In this world, it's a huge mystery. We'll never know. There's no way to describe it in physical words. It's such pleasure, spiritual highest pleasure, that it doesn't exist. There's no way to describe it. It's like trying to describe to a blind person the color blue. He never saw colors. He was born blind. Listen, you know, wow, what the sky is so beautiful and blue. What blue? It's similar to green. What is green? It's, uh, it's very relaxing. What do you mean relaxing? He has no idea what blue is. How are you going to describe to him the color blue? There's no way to do it. Open his eyes one minute or one second. Show him blue. Close his eyes again. Now he knows what you're talking about. Without it, 500 years he won't have any idea what blue is. Doesn't exist in his vocabulary, in his computer. He doesn't know what to imagine. If now you close your eyes and someone tell you about a great steak he ate, you have an image. Someone tell you, I went with a shiduch with a very pretty girl. I want to get married. So he's imagining a girl. I got the best computer in a store. He's imagining a laptop. I got the new phone such and such. He's imagining a picture. Everything in life, when people talk to you, right away a picture comes to your image. It helps you to understand the details. Not always the picture is exact, but at least you know what he's talking about. But if you're blind, you never saw colors, there's no way to describe colors to you. No way. Table, you can touch, you can have an idea. Colors, there's no way to know if you're blind. That's how it is in the next world. There is no way to understand this greatness of God. But it's one thing I, I know. If God says, I'm faithful to pay reward to my lovers forever after they die, I will reward you in your end. If you only listen to me and don't make sins and keep my Shabbat and keep all the things that the Torah says, I will reward you in endless way. Who am I to disagree with that or to challenge it or to have a question or a doubt? How can you even doubt? What? People from the Knesset make all kinds of promises or from Congress, all the fools believe them. Knowing they never keep the word. But when it comes to God, and he always keeps his word, he's not the liar. Midvar Sheker Tirchak, I'm the faithful God. I'm faithful to pay reward. I will punish the wicked people. With God, you have a doubt? How can there be such thing? You just want right now, right? No. Right now, it's not going to be. You have to have patience. Soon it's going to happen. Life is short anyway. But if people will stay the same, they are American, secular, live the moment, be successful, live party here, party there, wear whatever you want, eat whatever you want, marry whoever you want, there will be major consequences, major. I promise you, all the people who went against Hashem, they, will, they all regretted it big time. 
you, you cannot win against Hashem. You can't. You either join him or you destroy yourself. That's why I, I was here. Baruch Hashem, I was invited here. I only came here for one reason. To make another few souls here wake up. Because my experience showed that most of the Jews are not religious, not because they're bad and evil. Because they are ignorant. It's a different. Once you educate them a little bit, that's why I always give free CDs. People would listen, it will educate them. It will change their entire view on life. Their entire view of life. I had liberal lefties, pro-Ara, pro-Hamas, hating the Israeli army, all kinds of rotten opinions. While they started to listen to the CDs and started to understand what's God, what's Ishmael, they had a whole picture now. Say, so, wow, I cannot believe I had this kind of political opinions. I'm ashamed. And one guy told me, you know what a lefty I was? You know what I know what I used to do? As soon as I heard your Path to the Just series, I cannot look at myself in the mirror anymore. I thought I'm humanic, I'm not barbarian, with all the brainwash that I had in the university and all this thing. One or two lectures changes the entire view on life. And then on Shabbat, and then on marriage, and then on raising children. No one knows better than God what's good for us. Keep it in your mind. Don't forget. Rosh Hashanah, don't waste time. Retailing, do tshuva, go to the synagogue, listen to the shofar. It's important to hear shofar. Don't, no jokes, no driving in a car. Keep it. Now you have Shabbat, keep it. Rosh Hashanah, two days, keep it. Hopefully you'll have the strength to continue and then you keep Kippur and then you move into Sukkot. Do it. It's, it's important days for your own good. Bezrat Hashem, I want to wish every one of you Shana Tova, Ktiva and Khatima Tova. We all have the schut to do Tshuva. Thank you very much for having us here. Shana Tova. Thank you. Thank you.